This is the Etude, Opus 101, number 60. lovely piece. An etude is uh, a French word and it means a study of some sort. So for us as pianists it is some sort of technical skill perhaps that the composer wants us to use and work on in this piece. Um, sometimes it's a specific interval. You could have an etude in sixths for example and it's working on the intervals of a sixth. This composer doesn't really say what the technique is, it's just etude. And that's actually pretty common. There's thousands of etudes out there, and all we know is that it's a study until you get into the piece and get to know it a little better. So I think you can hear from the initial uh, performance that the hands feel like they're copying each other. There's some imitation going on. So it feels like the left hand and right hand are going to do this sort of call and response. So that skill here in measure one and measure two, you hear this call and response. We want each hand to have the melody. So we've got to develop that skill where the left hand and the right hand are equally strong and taking over the melody. And to be a good pianist, both hands really have to be developed to the same level. If the right hand is always really strong and only playing the melody, what happens when the left hand has to play the melody? So that seems to be the question that our composer is striving to help us grow and develop in this piece. So I'm gonna point that out. It happens several times. Measure one and two, measure five and six. It's the same idea, an octave, um, or actually the same octave, I should say. Mm -hmm. But noticing at measure five that this time the left hand starts the call and begins the melody with the right hand responding in measure six. Moving to the second half of the piece at measure nine, you will find that the hands have shifted, still doing the call and response, but instead of being in this A minor position that we started in, A, C, E, at measure nine we move to the relative major key, C, C major. And so we move to that relative key right there. So that is a really big area that we're developing in this piece. So I suggest when you're beginning practice that you play those measures, there's always two measures set together, play them with just the hand that has the melody first. What we're trying to do is train your ear to hear that melody as the priority. So in measure two, I would caution you not to play like this where I hear more of that right hand dominance and less of the left hand. We need the left hand to sing out. Right hand comes in quieter. So that way we have a clear idea as a listener, oh, okay, the melody has shifted down here to that lower left hand part. So that would be one way to practice uh, a couple of spots there. One, two, measures five, six, nine, 10, and 13, 14, where you just play that melodic portion with the single hand, and then go back and add the opposite hand with that accompanying set of notes. All right, and then as you're working through, I already mentioned the shift between A minor and C major, so you're gonna to wanna to plan for that in your practice so that you're prepared. So on measure eight, for example, at the end of that first section, as you're finishing up with the right hand having a rest for the two quarter rest there 
and the left hand you're playing that little tail end there so just to put it back in your ear you have while the right hand is resting here I would suggest you move it forward just a small motion forward helps you place that C major because it's coming next and then you have all of measure 9 for the left hand to find its C major shift. So you have written in pauses, rests, that the composer has provided so that you can set up. I find students often wait until they're on, the measure is there, and oh wait, I'm not there yet. And then there's kind of that awkward hiccup ah, where you run and try to find that spot. So use the pauses created by the composer to help you um, well, not really pauses, but the rest, use the rest provided by the composer so that you're able to shift your hand. Yes, that takes some planning. Yes, you must practice those two measures there at measure eight and nine. And again, at measure, uh, what is that, 16, when you return back to the first measure. So those are two practice spots you can just kind of block off and say, okay, I'm gonna practice that and get that hand position shift so that I'm prepared to go on. So that would be a wonderful idea to work that way. I'm also, as I mentioned, the end of the piece, what appears to be the end at uh, measure 16, there's a DC Alfine, so you must wrap around to the top of the piece, start again at measure one, and you notice there's a full double bar line at measure eight with the word Fine printed on the top. So that's where you're ending. This is actually six lines long, not just the four that's printed when you add in that DC Alfine. So that would be very helpful to keep all of those items in mind. And then besides finding your positions, the shifts, and being able to hear that combination of call and response, knowing which hand is in charge. That's a really big deal. So once you get kind of those initial workouts, then we go on to the next set of ideas to develop. So when you're playing both hands together at measure two, measure six, measure nine, measure 14, when we're doing those two measures, the melody hand, sure, that'll be loud. The opposite hand, in this case the right hand, must play softly. Sometimes I encourage students, if you're really struggling, to get the hands in the right balance, where we hear one hand louder than the other, then you could try ghosting the opposite hand, the hand that's supposed to be quieter. That's kind of a fun word, isn't it? Ghosting. So what we do is we leave the hand on the key, we actually touch the key surface, and the key might actually sound just a little bit. But what I'm really trying to do is use so little pressure that the key doesn't sound, or it doesn't sound very often. So I get this. This hand played, but it wasn't really heard. So what I'm trying to do is train the ear to hear that melodic line as the most important thing. That's what I wanna hear. And then the right hand, kinesthetically, I'm trying to pull back so that I don't feel as much pressure on the key. I'm just using slight pressure. I'm taking it so far to the extreme that I'm not even putting enough pressure to have the key strike fully. So that is a skill if you're really struggling to get that balance. I would take it all the way down to ghosting and just get that right hand under control. Our right hands tend to be very dominant. If you're right-handed, you're used to doing a lot of things with your right hand. So. Sometimes that's what needs to happen. However, when we get to measure six, it's the opposite. So this time we go back to the right hand having the tune. Left hand, you must be quieter there. So, where I can still hear that melody. So that would be a practice session that may take a few days. Um, and it doesn't have to be, you know, 30 minutes at a time, but even if you just spent maybe 10 minutes working on those two measures or take a set of four measures with those uh, needs, you could correct that, I think, pretty quickly with some focused practice, even in short segments there. All right, and then there's a few other things in the score that we want to notice. Uh, when you are at measure seven, that left hand has an E there, right in the middle of the piano, noticing that that E ties across to the first beat of the eighth measure. So it's a little hard to see that we have a slur, a curvy line there, but we also have a tie, all happening in the same measure. So two curvy lines, how do we tell them apart? Well, remember, the tie is always connecting 
to its exact same note somewhere else. So when you play that rhythm, I'm gonna play measure seven and eight, just the left hand so you can hear the rhythm. One and two and three and tie and. So you hear that tied note there. So be cautious that you have the rhythm correct. Secondly, if that wasn't enough to keep you busy, we find that the composer has added an accent on that tied note. So we want to just have a little bit of emphasis there as we carry that note across the bar line. And if you listen carefully there, right on that spot, Hear how that E sustains there. So you want to really have that in your ear. You don't have to thump out the thumb and make it super loud, but just give it a little bit more pressure so we can hear it through the change of bar line there and that you hear that present E. It's kind of holding there. Uh, a little bit of a, a short pedal tone, if you will, done by the finger. Okay, that happens again in its counterpart at measure 15 crossing to 16. You'll find also that held note in the left hand with the G, the type. And then the last thing that I want to bring out um, is playing the slurs carefully. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, before I get into that, I will say one more thing. Measure 10, please notice that your left hand is moving into the treble clef. <coughs> Pardon me. Got a frog in my throat or something there. So at measure 10, you're going to play from that second half of the piece will always be in the treble clef. So noticing that you're playing around the middle C range, which I showed you on the camera, but just wanted to point that out if you're following along on the sheet music and you feel a little confused there. Okay, so the last level of study for this etude is to bring out the correct articulation with the legato phrase structure. So we have no staccato written in this piece, but we do have these beautiful legato phrases that we want to do well. So at the piano, we wanna make sure that the elbows are slightly away from the torso here so that the wrist is level and even. And this is written in one or two measure phrase structure. So the initial theme, that's one phrase to itself. It's almost like I'm drawing a circle with my wrist here when you follow through with that nice long legato. Left hand, you'll copy. It's a little harder to do the left hand because you're right here in front of the body. When you're playing right in front of your torso, that is actually the hardest place to get a really good hand position and to get a, an, an expressive legato. So just be aware of that and work so that you can feel comfortable there. Sometimes I kind of move my torso back a little bit so I have room to work. However it works for you, you'll have to try that out and see. Hands together measure two. You'll have that same structure. So you see both hands rolling to the right. At the end of the phrase, we just do a simple release of the fingertips. A lot of times we do that with the help of the wrist. So if we go into measures three and four, for example, there's the wrist releasing. So you just lift the wrist, the fingertips lift off the key slightly and come right back down in position. Left hand, release. Together, release. So that's something that you could work towards. When you have the two measure phrase, so this is measure three and four, and you find it again in the C major version at measure 11 and 12, you'll notice just the way that the music is designed with contrary motion, that the elbows will roll away from the body outward. Come back in. Da da, out, in, and then we roll to the left. And right hand, you complete by that E to the right. So that's some very, very specific directions. And I'm sure your teacher can work with you some more on that. But getting that phrase structure 
correctly is not just playing the correct notes and rhythms and playing a general legato feel, but going on to perfecting that phrasing. And music, these are called musical phrases you could almost say like a musical sentence. What do you do when you finish reading a sentence in a book? If you're reading out loud, you're probably gonna stop and take a breath. So when we have those phrase endings, there's an actual little bit of a lift, a breath there. It's not that you take a rest or a big pause. I don't wanna mislead you in that way, but that you have a little bit of a, and then you go forward. You know, singers, and wind instruments, people that play wind instruments, they have to breathe, they have to breathe, or they can't make music. The air coming from inside of them, that's the propelling force for their instrument. But for us as pianists, our breathing isn't affected by what we do with the hands necessarily, but our phrase structure is still designed the same way. So I wanted to, to bring that out to you. I hope that you have a great time learning and practicing this etude, and I will check in with you next time. If this video was helpful, go ahead and give it a like, and I hope to see you soon.